Staying with the theme of brain imaging, we're going to review two more approaches. Now, the first one is anatomical. So the EEGs were recording ongoing changes in electrical activity. That's physiolo physiological. Anatomical uh, investigation is concerned with what are the structures there? What bits are there in the brain and how do they connect up? And it's specifically with regard to connections within the brain, which nerve cells are connected to which other nerve cells. That's the, the first imaging that we're going to look at is concerned with. Now, the brain is massively interconnected, but nerve cells are very, very tiny, and their extensions are very hard to follow. Um, it's proven, it, it eluded neuroscientists for decades to be able to trace these fine connections from one area to the next. But recently we have developed two techniques, one called diffusion tensor imaging and the other diffusion spectrum imaging. We don't care about the difference. These allow us to trace the connections from individual neurons to the neurons that they connect to. This has only been recent, uh, recently possible and it has given rise to very powerful images. Here, for example, is a marmoset brain and you're seeing some of the long-range connections that exist in a marmoset brain. Of course, the colors here are added by the printer. These are for imaging purposes. The marmoset brain is not really this colorful, but these colorful images have become known as brain bows because they are typically represented like this. Now, it would be easy to think that we must have found the anatomy of the human brain a long time ago, and people have been slicing up brains for a long time. But the ability to follow these connections has recently led, as recent as 10 years ago, recently led to the discovery of a huge structure in the human brain that was absolutely unknown before. This is a band of nervous, of connections between nerves, long range connections from the back of the brain to the front of the brain that runs like a big sheet throughout the brain. You can see it there and it's, it looks like a fabric. We've got warp and weft. And you can see the profile view there in the brain. This is a major anatomical structure found only 10 years ago using this because you had to be able to follow those connections in order to find it. So anatomy is not dead yet. But let's go back now to, well, we'll stick with anatomy first and then we'll move to physiology again. We're going to look ultimately at fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging. But first we have to know what magnetic resonance imaging is. You may have been in a scanner like this. MRI scanners are routine medical devices used for forming highly detailed images of any part of the body. They are not x-rays. They image soft tissue extremely well and they look rather frightening actually. You've got a small tunnel or bore in the middle into which the person to be examined is slotted. So you're inside this tube and there's huge magnets around you. If we were to open up this MRI machine, that's what it looks like on the inside. You can see the small bore that the person goes in and these huge magnets are now gonna spin at high velocity making a fierce racket. It's uh, not a very pleasant place to be. Importantly, these are not x-rays. They use advanced physics, and I'm just going to put it there, advanced physics, <laughs> to generate their images. And most people using these for clinical purposes or research purposes do not understand the advanced physics that makes these images possible. They employ very strong magnetic fields, strong enough to rip any jewelry out of your body, which is why you must take off all metal before getting into one of these. But the images are very, very detailed, and we can get three-dimensional volumetric images, which we'll have to look at slice by slice, but we can image the whole body. These are anatomical images, and they're quite slow to generate. So they're not snapshots, and they're not going to show us any activity. They're going to just show us the anatomy. And this is where those images come from that we saw when we had a look at brain tutor. There's a transverse cross-section, a sagittal cross-section, and a coronal cross-section. Because we're getting three-dimensional data, and we have to slice it up to look at it. So MRI provides us with the anatomy of the brain and surrounds. Around, that's been with us since about the 1970s. 
and in the 1990s it was noted that you could use the same technology to make a different kind of image. Amazing! This gave rise to a field known as functional magnetic resonance imaging and these are the images that have taken the world by storm. In fMRI a different kind of signal is attended to. What fMRI records is changes in, in the regional blood flow. Specifically it tracks a marker which carries oxygen on blood and the oxygen level of blood going to an organ is different from the oxygen level of blood coming from an organ. In this way, by recording the oxygen content, you can spot changes in blood flow. This does not measure anything going on in neurons. It measures blood flow, right? Blood. Um, and with this provides us with coordinates for an area in which blood flow is different between contrasting conditions. And we can look at that overlaid on a structural MRI so, we, so that we know what the underlying anatomy is. Now blood flow changes slowly in the brain. If I do something, I did that to me, now there'll be a small change in blood flow associated with it which is going on about now. So there's about a five second lag. So this has lousy temporal resolution but very good spatial resolution because we can say where it is. So. Remember, this is not measuring the activity of neurons. It's measuring differences in blood flow. It can only compare blood flow between experimental conditions. So from the 1990s on, we developed a complex series of a way to build experiments in which you always have contrasting conditions. So in one condition, for example, the person has their eyes closed. In the other condition, the person has their eyes open. And you measure the regional blood flow in each case and you look for differences. So this way of building an image is completely tied to the design of experiments in which is a contrast because all we can get at are changes in regional blood flow that differ between experimental conditions. How do you go about this? Well first you do an MRI scan in order to find out what the underlying anatomy is. Everyone's brain is different from everyone else's brains. They're very difficult to average across, so you have to know what the person's brain looks like. And then you do a whole lot of scans. These are much lower resolution. They take about five seconds each. And if we have two conditions, let's say one is with a stimulus, one is without, or one is eyes closed and one is eyes open, you do half the scans in one case, half the scans in the other, and then you subtract one from the other to see where the blood flow changes. So you start with an MRI image like this. You've got an experiment with contrasting conditions. In one experiment, for example, um, subjects in the scanner spoke a sentence together with a recording, or they spoke a sentence together with an experimenter in live interaction. They do this many, 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 many times. Um, you can't actually speak while we're scanning, but because of the very slow response of the blood flow, you can speak and we can scan afterwards. And then you subtract condition one from condition two and you find that there's changes in regional blood flow in these areas. Nothing lights up in the brain. The color is just colored ink. The resolution is rather poor compared with the MRI image. And the kind of jargon that goes with these is shown here on the slide. But these images really set the world alight. They inflame the imagination because people immediately believe that you could read things off these. You could see people thinking or you could see the seat of the emotions. Nonsense. Critical interpretation of these needs to keep a few things in mind. First of all, we're looking at the brain under experimental conditions in which we've repeated the conditions of the two experimental conditions many, many, many times. We're not looking at any activity of an active organ making sense of its world. We're looking at an organ in a weird, structured situation of the experiment. We're also looking at an individual organ. As I said, brains differ greatly, so we have to interpret it in terms of the underlying anatomy for this person. And what we're measuring is changes in blood flow. The relationship between blood flow and whatever the neurons are doing is poorly understood, I'm afraid. And we seem to have this natural urge to associate function with location. 
Function in this case, the function that features in the name functional MRI, refers to the fact that experimental conditions have been established and we will interpret those as if we knew what the subject was doing in one case and we knew what the subject was doing in the other. So we have a full account of what's going on. Um, yeah, but these images have captured a public imagination like nothing else. What people are generally unaware of is how difficult and how imprecise they are, not only imprecise, but how much interpretation is required. We're not recording brain activity, we're recording changes in blood flow supplying the brain. We cannot simply infer function from location, and so interpretation here is very difficult. But just as with the galaxy brain images, once people see colored ink on brains, they go nuts. So people love them some fMRI images.